A clergyman is shot with his own pistol. I could tell it was gunshots. No other sound sounds like a gunshot. And intruders leave him for dead. I didn't know if he's going to make it or not. Plus, a high-speed chase. I thought maybe I just had a drunk driver. Delivers more than one rookie was expecting. Officer, I'm having a baby! I guess I was more scared than ever, actually. On Rescue 911. Three times a week, Pastor Dale Osmond visited nursing homes and hospitals in and around Somerset, Kentucky, spending time with ailing members of his congregation. Those who live in this rural community found comfort and reassurance in his kindness. But as he headed for home on January 21st, 1992, he never once imagined that he would be the one reaching out for help. The call came in to Somerset Pulaski County Dispatcher Randy Tarter. Who's Dale Osmond? He's a preacher at Bethlehem Baptist Church. Uh, I've known him for several years. He's, he's a good friend of mine. The assistant supervisor on duty that day was Don Smith. The thing seemed to be just a normal call. He had all of his information down the well and appeared to be just a residential burglary. Okay, sir. What's your phone number, please? Wait a minute. One, three, wait a minute. And I could tell it was gunshots. No other sound sounds like a gunshot. I've been shot. Get an ambulance. I've been shot. I had been in training for about two weeks, and I've been on the radio about one week. Yeah, I was shaky. I was shaky because that was a, one of the first major, major calls that I'd ever taken. Don took over the call. Sir? Yeah? I need to get some more inf information from you. Where were we shot at? In the leg. Oh. Who shot you? I don't know who he was. He come up the steps from the basement. Oh. Is there anyone there with you? No. Okay, can you get to a towel or something to try to stop the bleeding? Oh, I can't move. My legs are killing me. Okay, so let me talk to Hamlet just a minute. You stay on the line with me, okay? Mr. Osmond lived 15 to 20 minutes from our base. Now, this is not 15 or 20 minutes as you and I would get in our Sunday vehicle and drive. This is 15 minutes running wide open as fast as you can go in an ambulance. Can, can you tell me what you were shot with? It's my old gun. Go ahead. What, what caliber? It's a 22. Oh. Call, call my neighbors, get somebody over here, help me. He asked me to call his neighbor, but from day one in dispatching, you're taught if you have a critical caller, never hang up. What's your neighbor's name? In Mr. Osmond needed help bad, and the nearest unit was still 15 to 20 minutes away. I had to make the call. Okay, I'm going to hang up and call your neighbor, okay? Uh, yeah. I never made connection with his neighbor. When I tried to call Mr. Osmond back, the line was busy. The scariest moment was when I couldn't make contact with Mr. Osman. I called and called, and it was busy. By the third call, getting a busy single, uh, I was beginning to get uh, pretty panicked myself. 97, your scene is unsecure. Your scene is unsecure. When we continue, 
He was in a lot of pain. His left leg had really swollen a lot. I felt like that it must have hit a big artery. like a like you'd hear in a horror picture of a ghost just reeling and screaming a lot of times the screams were so loud through the phone that i would have to hold the phone away from my ear let me ask you something did you hear him pull away in a car no oh, there ain't no car here no vehicle the gun is in the rescue within 10 minutes of the shooting dale's friend jc tartar got to the house somebody's here yeah okay who is it he was in quite a bit of pain. His shin was swelled real big and it was black. It was hard to get his pants up enough to even see his leg. The bullet looked like it cut the main artery with so much blood inside. Sheriff's Deputy William Ryan assessed the victim as soon as he got to the scene. He was in a lot of pain. His left leg had really swollen a lot. I felt like that it must have hit a big artery because it was real blue and swollen three times as big as it should have been. I didn't know if he's going to make it or not. Paramedic Mark Perkins and his partner arrived within 25 minutes. The first thing I noticed when I got the ambulance, I could hear the patient screaming, and we were about halfway down the driveway from the house. 22 caliber weapon is one of the most dangerous handguns. It's a low velocity weapon. A 9 millimeter will go through the human body while a 22 will stay in the human body and bounce around. So I've got to worry about the bleeding of the patient, the bones, and just how much damage this thing has done. I was concerned about the limb, but not as concerned as I was about the whole life. The leg would be a bonus if we could save it, but we needed to save him. Because the nearest major trauma center was more than 80 miles away in Lexington, Dale was taken to the local hospital. At Lake Cumberland Regional Hospital, he was examined by a team of doctors, including surgeons Keith Sinclair and Don Brown. It was almost as if the bullet had eyes to go to the worst part, because he hit the artery right where it branches off in three places. Mr. Osman, I'm Dr. Sinclair, I'm one of the general surgeons here. Oh, you, from a single shot like that, I don't think it could have done any more damage. Uh, there's, there really wasn't anything which it hadn't broken. The bullet had tumbled. It had taken out the artery supplying the lower leg, the nerve supplying the sensation to the foot and one of the bones. Uh, I've seen patients like Dale with injuries to lower extremities not only lose their legs from such injuries, but also die. As Dale was rushed into surgery, his wife Brenda was left to cope with the uncertainty. Thanks a lot. A couple of my friends, you know, we have... At that point, we gathered together and, and had a word of prayer, you know, in private. And... Uh, after that, I felt better. I felt like regardless of what, regardless if Dell's leg did have to go below the knee or whatever, you know, that we could make it and be fine. Um, his life was what was important. 
After I was discharged from the hospital, I asked my own physician uh, what would have happened if they'd flown me to Lexington uh, by helicopter that day. And he said, uh, no doubt I would have lost my leg and uh, I may have lost my life. So I was really thankful to the Lord, really, just to be alive and, and to be able to still carry out what God had called me to do. Five days after I was released from the hospital, I performed the wedding of my son and my youngest daughter in a double wedding ceremony. I always cry at weddings, but uh, this was especially important because God had been good enough to me to spare my life where I could do it. He said he was small for his age. The doctors were telling him he was big for his age. Mom mm -hmm. said he was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. If anyone comes home and finds that their home has been burglarized, they should not go in the residence. They should go to a neighbor's house or to a friend's house and summon for help. I always thought if someone was in my home that it wouldn't be any problem for me to shoot them. But uh, I found out I couldn't shoot another human being. <laughs> I made a mistake. I made two mistakes. Number one, I picked up my own weapon. Number two is I should not have entered the house to begin with. The young suspect was subsequently arrested and found guilty of burglary and assault, but in response to Dale's request, was only sentenced to five years probation. Ever since I've been a, a pastor, I've been trying to help people. I did not think prison would help this young man. If I tell a lie, it not only affects me, it affects my wife and it affects my children. It... He's enjoying life. Anything that, that he can possibly do, he does. He really does. Um, he's not one to sit down and quit. <laughs> uh, Dale's always been on the move and this has just simply slowed him down a little bit. Next, with each step I took, I got a little more scared. I was preparing myself to either have to take a life or for mine to be taken. September 6, 1993, had been an uneventful night on police officer Christopher Lewis's beat in the rural community of Conway, Arkansas. As his shift was winding down, the stillness of the pre-dawn hours was suddenly shattered, and he was forced to resort to tactics they never taught in the police academy. when I observed a van coming down the road driving erratically at a high rate of speed. I fell in behind the van, uh, turned on the blue lights, and tried to initiate a stop. At that point, I thought maybe I just had a drunk driver. Usually when you fall in behind an intoxicated driver, they try to straighten up, not try to show that they've been drinking. The van did not slow down at all. They seemed to react to me turning on the blue lights and rather than trying to straighten up, they were trying to get away. It was as though it wanted to get away at any cost. I feel like at the time that I've just fallen into a situation in which they have committed a violent crime. A backup unit was launched from the Conway Police Department. I'm still a rookie, and I've only been on the street about three months. Fear of the unknown, I guess, is probably the worst fear of all. The attention level goes up, uh, the alertness goes up, and the heart rate goes up quite a bit. All of a sudden, the van comes to an abrupt stop.
I didn't know whether to expect the back doors were going to fly open and they might try to come out shooting. X-ray 50, Colonel. I'm going to be out Paul Zebra George, 486, be on Harrison and Tyler. Everything was quiet. Maybe they just wanted to get rid of me before my backup could get there. Stay in the vehicle! Stay in the vehicle! At this point, I hear moans coming from inside the van. And the first thing that goes through my mind is a hostage situation. With each step I took, I got a little more scared. I was preparing myself to either have to take a life or for mine to be taken. Mm. Mm. Officer, I'm having a baby! When I saw there was a pregnant woman, uh, I guess I was more scared than ever, actually. Can we go ahead and send an ambulance to location? She's trying to apologize to me for the way she's driving, uh, which is totally unnecessary. All I want to know is how long I've got. Do we have time to make it to the hospital? He's coming! Okay, okay, okay. Try and relax. The ambulance is on the way, okay? When I see the baby's head, I start to step up into the van. Uh, the only place for me to get is on the steering wheel. So I position my butt on the steering wheel of the van to catch the baby when it comes out. Okay, go ahead and push for me, okay? It's starting to come. We spend a lot of time and training on what to do in a violent situation. Uh, very little on what to do in a situation like this. I've got his head. I was doing all I could to keep from going into shock at that point. All right. Okay, it's coming out, okay? Just keep on pushing. After I got a hold of the baby's head, I started to calm down a little bit and begin to think, now, the baby's head is out. What am I going to do if something goes wrong? Are you okay? Okay, we're going to be just fine. Ambulance is on the way right now, okay? The original backup officer, Sergeant Chip Stokes, arrived, who happened to be an EMT. Because I had the training and experience in it, I went ahead and we traded places, and then I've continued to deliver. Good deep breath for me. There you go, push. The conditions were, were very adverse because it was cool out there that night. I could definitely see relief in his face when I got there. There you go. Baby's out. Yeah. Oh, Good. Great. Oh, Great. Oh, Great. Look at here. You got it? Look at there, Mom. Sure enough. Big Appreciate and strong. This baby, when he came out, he was hollering loud. All we had to do was pretty much wipe away uh, some of the mucus from the airways and wrap the baby up, uh, keep the baby warm. To bring life into the world like that. Um, that's the last thing I thought I was going to be doing. He's a big, strong boy. He sure is. After the rush is over and you stop and you look at the child that, that just came into the world with your assistance, it's breathtaking. To stand back and to look and say, this is one of those things that I never planned on, but I sure am glad it happened. Take the baby to the and shake him out a little bit more. You always hear about policemen having to take someone's life, but here was a, a beautiful example of a policeman bringing life into the world. Delbrick King had delivered a healthy seven pound, 14 ounce baby boy. She and her husband Milton named him Christopher, the same as the first officer on the scene who helped him be born. When Delbra went into labor with her eighth child, she'd thought she could make it to the hospital in time. My husband's at work and I didn't think about calling anybody else at 5.30 in the morning. I just felt like I could do it. What is it? Turn around, you do it. When I heard the two police officers had delivered the baby, I thought that was pretty wild. Uh, because, uh, well, who would think that would ever happen to my wife, you know? <laughs> but it did, and uh, I'm glad that they were there. I give uh, great gratitude to both of them. Recently, Delbra's whole family got a chance to meet the two officers who helped deliver baby Christopher. The feeling of delivering a child is like nothing else in the world. It's exciting to see her with the baby. Uh, they're so happy together, and you can't help but feel like you're part of that when you were there with the birth experience to bring him into the world. He, um, it's just great to see him doing fine. Let me see if I can hold him again. <laughs> this isn't the first time. Police get a lot of uh, negative press. They get a lot of negative uh, situations that they encounter. Uh, and to be involved in something that's so positive and to make such a difference in somebody's life is really great. <laughs> To bring a life into the world like that, it's something that I definitely want to experience as far as having a baby of my own. I look forward to it. I don't think I'll be the one to deliver it, but I do look forward to it.
In the United States, 10 children a day die as a result of gunshot wounds. If you must have a gun in your home, always store the weapon and ammunition separately and keep them locked away. This series is dedicated to all the men and women who choose to get involved when a life is at stake. I'm William Shatner. Join us again next week for more true stories on Rescue 911. Step out of the car, please.